On today's episode of the Fear Fiction Podcast, our two stalkers summarize and discuss the novel Roadside Picnic by the Strugatsky Brothers, the 1971 philosophical sci-fi romp into the illegal zone, a place of wonders and dangers that touch down in some English-speaking country. I assure you, comrade, this totally doesn't take place in the USSR. Introducing male lesbian dead ballot and lesbian of low intellect Chelsea. I've been Radiohead and I've been told I'm not allowed to sell things at this location and on this date. Kick it to the Cold War, Chelsea. Oh, in the dark, you run them over. Okay, what are we, what are we doing? Uh, that's a great question. What are we doing? What this is Chelsea's doing? episode. You fucking, <laughs> you figure it no, out. No, I don't want to. Okay, so I'm going to explain Roadside Picnic to you. This is something that we've wanted to do for a while. We were contemplating, we, we just haven't had enough time to do it, but we wanted to do a podcast where I'm illiterate. Mm-hmm. And the premise of the podcast, like separate from Fear Fic, is just... I can't talk, you're illiterate, I explain books to you, and you try to guess the titles. Or just, you know, enjoy the, you know... The verbal fuck-ups of me trying to explain a book. So the project of reading to my illiterate boyfriend has been put on the back burner, and the day... You could say it's on the bookshelf. (laughs) On the bookshelf. (laughs) On the book burner. Yeah, (laughs) No. We are going to read Strigatsky's Roadside Picnic. Not the entire book, but you will summarize the book and I explain s- it to me. Yes. If you don't know about Roadside Picnic, you might better know of the 1980s film. Uh, what, what is it? It's just called Stalker, right? Yeah, it's just called Stalker. There's Stalker, which is both based off the book Roadside Picnic. And then the movie has a video game based off of it, also called Stalker, yep, which it, takes place in Ukraine yep. and has now spun off into the Metro series, which the new Metro game might get delayed a little bit. Metro also takes place in Ukraine, right? Yes, correct. So the interesting thing is um, Roadside Picnic was written by two brothers. Uh, both of whom were born in USSR. Uh, One was born in Georgia under USSR rule, and the other one was born in Russia. One of the brothers worked as a translator, so he translated English and Japanese books into Russian, and uh, he really liked the word stalker. It's a good word. (laughs) Get in here, stalker. All right, get in here, stalker. But him and his brother wrote a bunch of different books, one of which is Roadside Picnic, but one is a series called, like, The Noon Universe, which actually inspired Avatar, the one with blue people, not the superior one with airbending. With no blue people. With no Chelsea's p- racist against blue people. <laughs> well, Cora had blue people in it. It did. Cora <laughs> was blue at one point. Anyway. She was dabba dabadi. Anyway, I thought that was a little interesting tidbit to throw in there. Hey, little interesting tidbits. tidbits. Here for bits of history, literary history. And so, yep. the they're both the Strugatsky brothers, or what's the yes. deal? Okay. Yes, they are the... And they, to my understanding, actually died shortly after Roadside Picnic. So there are some questions a lot of people have regarding Roadside Picnic that will never be explained because they died. That is uh, an interesting thing. And, you know, you're talking about, well, well, we'll get into the plot, but, you know, it might make you a little conspiracy, conspiracy theory a little bit. Like, why they die? Were they revealing something? We have so many questions. <laughs> but what we, I guess let's just get into a okay. synopsis of the story itself. Okay. And again, this inspired the Stalker video games and eventually that inspired the Metro games. This is Russian, I guess you could say, it, it's a it's a weird thing where the video games are very much so entrenched in politics, but I'm guessing the book isn't quite as much. The film wasn't. Um, I feel like I literally just reread the book, like, over, what, the last 40 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, like, I feel like there's a lot of philosophy and politics and just main characters being humans reacting to living in a distinct dystopian hellscape yeah that's what i call europe yeah (laughs) so like i feel like there's quite a bit there's quite a reflection of politics in there that 
did not translate to the movie at all, which is hysterical. The the movie, and I, I know a lot of people aren't going to sit down and watch the Stalker movie. It's like two hours. It's a very slow burn, but I, I highly recommend people do it at some point because it is a very... It's enjoyable. It's a contemplative movie. But y- you have to go into it knowing that it's very slow. You need to know that. It is not a modern action movie. It's um it's not even a modern psychological thriller. It mm-hmm. is it is art house as art house gets, but trust me, it it is worth it. There is um some interesting payoffs with it. But Which actually the brothers that wrote Roadside Picnic were involved with writing the script for the movie. And the reason that this is counted under internet horror is because you can just go out and download that stalker PDF, okay? The only thing to know is that some of the names are translated differently in the PDF versus the actual book, uh, which did lead, lead to some confusion for myself when I finished reading said PDF and then decided to look for summaries just to make sure I would correctly be able to talk about some stuff. Uh, this is going to be an experiment. <laughs> so this is going to be interesting. We're going to see how well Chelsea can describe the plot. I, I can't wait for you to do a Harry Potter movie thing where you're like, oh shit, there were certain things that we left out of the first movies that we need to go re-explain. Cause, so so let's, let's get into a summary of Roadside Picnic. All right, so the summary is there are six places on Earth that have been turned into zones that have been just turned into weird alien hellscapes in certain ways and then in certain ways have been left pristine. So anomalous. Anomalous, yes. Anomalous. Fuck. Okay. That word, zones. That word, zones. (laughs) Annihilation, the Southern Reach trilogy, actually did something really interesting with the same concept, I think. So there there are zones, I'm guessing something came from outer space and turned them into zones. Yes. However, no, like nobody knows what it was. The book opens up with this scientist explaining, oh, yes, you know, I discovered that, like, actually, if you choose this one point in the universe and then you shoot it towards the Earth at this particular moment when they showed up, you find out that they all came from the same point. They all came from the same planet shooting at the pla- at, at our planet, essentially. Are they all on one side of the Earth? Basically. So, okay. Okay. So they're not all in, like, Russia, but they did hit the same side of the Earth. That's the interesting thing, is the story does not take place in Russia. The story takes takes place in an unnamed English-speaking country. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. Already a departure from the games and the movie. Right. Which is really, it's really fascinating how, like, because it was written in Russian, the games and the movies end up in areas in that part of the world. However, the book is just unnamed English-speaking country. Uh, Which the only thing we know is the scientist who is being interviewed in the first chapter is Canadian. Which leads you to think that maybe this is happening in Canada, which would make sense since Canada has a lot of Ukrainian dysphoria in it. That's not the That's Ukrainian not the dysphoria. It, what is the word then? Oh my god. How do you I pronounce lo- that word? Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I can't, Chelsea. <laughs> That's what that's what trust Justin Trudeau has. He's he has can- Canadian dysphoria, where he doesn't want to be a Canadian, so he's just putting on the blackface. Oh, no. He's like, no, dysphoria is when your body is the opposite of euphoria. It's what it's like gender dysphoria. Oh, so then what's the word I'm looking Di- for? <laughs> Diaspora. <laughs> so different. <laughs> Before this, I was just like. Fun of I'm not going to make fun of you as and much. And I'm like, no, you are, though. <laughs> I, I want you to actually be able to describe it. I'm not going to, like, undercut you and be a dick. And then you said Canadian dysphoria. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Brandon, you can't let that slide. <laughs> you can't. You can't let that slide. That's not okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that, that's like... That's like an American being like, listen, okay, I, I hate guns, I want socialized health care, and this is giving me a lot of personal anxiety. <laughs> I feel like I'm a Canadian on the inside. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not what that means. You, you, can't, just, you can't just claim that you have body dysphoria because you're not shaped like a Canadian. <laughs> Fuck. 
terrible fuck up was a good one. Okay. We're in Canada. We're in, we are potentially we're, in We're Canada. potentially in the Canada. Potentially. And we're at a zone that is, so it is kind of like based off of radioactive anxiety. Like the anxiety of nuclear energy and that kind of thing is kind yeah. of the premise. Because we have the Chernobyl, which is obviously yes. happening at the same time in the same area. So that is an anxiety, just like we get the anxiety of nuclear war and Godzilla. Right. We have Chernobyl and the zone. Yeah, and get out of here, stalker. And get out of here, stalker. Um, so something interesting actually is in the book, the UN steps, steps in and blocks off all the zones. Trying to make it impossible for people to come in, steal things, and then leave. Which is the job of a stalker, is to, you know, sneak in, take stuff, sell it to the highest voter, or alternatively, sneak people in to see the zones, and then sneak them back out. That, that almost... So, illegal tourism is part of their job. And so, why would they want to grab items from these zones? Um, because some of these items are um, very interesting to scientists who can't get hired by the UN, UN to study them. Other items are, um, like, there's this one in there that can make, like, really fascinating jewelry that women pay a shit ton of money for. So it, it's giving all kinds of different so like anomalous benefits. Yes. So we have these, I, I'm guessing early on in the story, we don't know where these zones come from. They just kind of, like, emerge. Right. And what is coming out of there is in many times as harmful and as possibly rewarding as what you get from SCP Foundation yes, anomalous objects. It is very SCP Foundation kind of stuff. Um, and the book does explain some of these things. Like there's, I think it's called Witch's Jelly, or at least that's what it's called on the PDF I read. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's the official translation or not. Well, there's this one character that in summary is like kept being referred to as, as Vulture. Okay. But the PDF I have, like his name is Buzzard. <laughs> Okay. So it's a lot of stuff like that. That's 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 <laughs> hilarious because whoever picked Buzzard was so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's like no. And it's like the character is very embodied by the word vulture, but like reading it, it's like why is he called Buzzard? <laughs> that's that's funny because we we don't think of, like they yes in practicality in reality both birds do similar things right but we don't we don't call someone a buzzard for ha having like being a money monger we call them a vulture right so that's such a weird translation error right that, that's that's Netflix adaptation of Evangelion. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so there's this witch's jelly. I think that's that's what it is. But, like, um, they try to study it, so they try to put it into a container and take it out of the zone. However, when they get it back to the facility, it just starts to melt through everything, and it ends up killing everybody in the facility. Okay. And it just collapses the whole building. Is this written as almost like an anecdote? Like, this is, like, in past tense, like, hey... Let me tell you yeah. about the the witch's jelly incident. Right. They basically. brought it in and it just destroyed them. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and then you know how in the movie, I mean, listening to this, you don't, you might. Well, not we have won't seen spoil the, movie. the very ending, or right. l let's say spoilers ahead. Potential spoilers for the book. I'm guessing we're going to get into spoilers for the book. Oh, most definitely. And the movie, we won't spoil the end because it's a slow burn, and you kind of don't want the ending spoiled. Right. But let's let spoil the stalker games because I know a lot of people don't necessarily have the dexterity to play a stalker game. So yeah. spoilers for the end of the stalker first video game. Okay. Anyway. All right. So let's get back to the book summary itself. Okay. Look, because I will get distracted and I talk in circles. No, you're so. fine. <laughs> I apologize to anybody out there I might confuse. Um, so the book starts off with the interview with the Canadian scientist, and then it moves on to the main character, who was initially a lab assistant, and then they found out he was using his credentials to sneak in, steal stuff, and then sell it on the side because he wasn't making a lot of money as a lab assistant. Um, so they found that out. And so he's a stalker in a very different, like other people yeah. are breaking in there. He's using his credentials. So he's not right. your prototypical stalker, black ops kind of guy. He's a scientist. Right. Well, he's a lab assistant. A lab assistant. Um, however, they, they, they catch him. Uh, he manages to run. He, it turns out his girlfriend is pregnant, which something in, um, 
something that happens with the zones is anybody who's a stalker that has a child, their child's DNA is not correct. Mm. It, it gets fucked up somehow. Mm. Scientists haven't figured out why. However, like they, they end up being not human, really. These children. So, well, if you talk about what actually happened at Chernobyl, there was a lot of like there was a degree of not respecting nuclear energy because people didn't understand nuclear energy. They didn't right. understand what it was. Right. And there's that specific bit in the Chernobyl uh, mini docu series. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where they have to explain to like a, a Russian general right. what actually it is. It's like imagine that there are a bunch of tiny bullets. They're trying to explain this, right? And this is the same thing where there's like this invisible effect that you can't explain where all of these kids are coming out with messed up DNA and it's like it's just spicy air how is it doing this right okay so it turns out I'm already fucking up the summary <laughs> it's fine we're fine <laughs> it's fine okay so initially he's a stalker and then he tries to clean up his act his name's red by the way okay um and to clean up his act he becomes a lab lab assistant which to help his boss who is also his friend he goes he sneaks into the zone to get a unique artifact, which is called a full empty, which causes his boss to die. Th these writers already just have such a way with words like stalker and like full empty. Like, full empty. You can definitely tell one of the brothers is obsessed with language because he's so good at choosing phrases. He, he's so good at just picking out interesting things. A full empty is like, oh, that's a, oh, that's, yeah, I like that. Right. That's so good. And then when Red finds out, he blames himself for his boss dying. Because his boss, like, hit some kind of web that causes, like, a day or two afterwards you to die of a heart attack. Okay. Uh, while they were in the zone trying to find the full empty. And then when he's in the bar where he just found out where his, like, how his friend died, the police are just like, Come here, stalkers, we're going to arrest you. I don't know why I'm using that accent, because this is probably taking place in Canada. <laughs> no, 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 We're red cotton in However, All of this, can I will this say, Canada bullshit, Chelsea's making it up. This is happening in Ukraine. Okay, yeah, suck it. This, this is happening in Ukraine. Something really interesting is there are definitely parts in the book where it's just, it, it left me in confusion, because it's like, okay, these are clearly foreign writers trying to write about an English-speaking country and getting certain things wrong, and it's just hysterical. It's You know what? It might even have that little quality that you get from Silent Hill games, where yeah. it's Japanese people interpreting right. a small American town. That's so charming. Yes. But it definitely reads just, it leads to interesting results, I think. Anyway, so um, this is when he finds out that his girlfriend is pregnant and her, her mom is like trying to pressure her into getting an abortion because her mom knows he's a stalker. Okay. And, and the gal is just like, no, I want to keep our child, even if, even if it's like a child that is, um, a vegetable, I guess, would be the best translation. She was just like, I just want to keep it because it, it belongs to you and me. Okay. And I love you. Okay. And she, like their conversation in the book is like so sad initially because she, she just assumes that he doesn't want anything to do with it. And like she's like, you know, it's fine. I love you. But like if you don't want to be in my life because I want to keep our child, that's fine. I, that's fine. You know, you go okay. do you. And he's just like, why would you assume I want nothing to do with you? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> anyway, so eventually he goes back to stalking with fellow stalker called the Vulture, or the Buzzard, if you get my PDF version of it. So we got my man Red and we got my man Vulture. Vulture. Which, something to note is that in between this, their kid is born. It turns out that she has, like, golden hair all over her and black eyes. So his nickname for her is, like, My Little Monkey, essentially. Okay. Because she looks like a monkey and the neighborhood kids make fun of her and he bribes the neighborhood kids into being her friend, essentially. Okay. By, like, buying them shit with the money he makes from being a stalker. So, mind you, I'm guessing that he's not, like, super wealthy, but I'm guessing he's somewhat well-to-do in the same way that a... I mean, he's a, well a, like, a good drug dealer is somewhat well-to-do. Like, right. yes, they're living in a slum area, not necessarily right. a nice neighborhood, but you are... You do have power. You do have right. influence. Well, I mean, it's one of those things where he, like, kept buying new stuff for the playground in the neighborhood. He's like, hey, kids, you know, like, I'll get you, like, a nice swing set. I'll get, like, I'll build you, like, a nice little playhouse. Just treat my daughter nicely. And, like, the neighborhood gossips are all very, like, paranoid about him because he keeps doing this and not explaining 
explaining it to them. So, so, so like, a bunch of mothers keep hanging out in the playground because they're like, why are you doing all of this? It sounds like traditional <laughs> mafia protection kind of thing. Of right. Like, yes, it is a predatory thing, but at the same time, it's like, no, you know, you, you, your father, he took care of the community, hey! Right, that kind of, right. Kind of thing. Something else to note, too, is, like, in the first chapter, they talk about, like, some of the weird shit that happened to the communities around the zone. Like, one of the, like, a district, everybody went blind, and scientists were like, well, what did you see that caused you to go blind? And, like, everybody they interviewed was just like, no, we didn't see shit. We heard this really loud noise, and then suddenly we were all blind. Oh, my God. And, like, that apparently happened to multiple districts. So, like, you have blind district one, blind district two, and then it just says, et cetera. <laughs> and it's like, how many blind districts are there? <laughs> Which it's, I thought that was such an interesting bit of world building. Th- it's really interesting that you can just have, like, okay, well, these these things popping up, they're called the zones, and it's causing a lot of things to just go awry in ways that they can't get a handle on. Right. Which, again, you're talking about scientists, you're talking about the media, you're talking about the government, all of these places of authority, again, just like in Chernobyl. Right. Trying to contain it and failing and, and then not trying understand, to lie about it. Trying to lie things. about it yeah. and not understanding it. Not believing the people who are having things happen to them. And the people who are having things happen to them are only having a fragment of the things happen to them. They're not getting the whole picture. Right. So everybody's perception is kind of colored by whatever effects are happening right. to them and their localized. No one has, they're all blind trying to touch the elephant in, right. and seeing different exactly. things. Something else interesting to note is there is a government um, department put together to try to convince people to move out of these districts. Like people who were there when the zone happened and they're like, hey, we need you to like move. We'll pay you however much you want, but like you can't stay here. So like um, Red mentions that like half the people in his town end up moving out, which is interesting because later in the book, like after like after the time skip where he's in prison, it turns out that like all these people that left, like they're like, you know, we don't have any conclusive evidence that this is connected. However, the more people that move from near the zone to other towns increases bad luck in those places. Okay. Which is really fascinating. So them in the their town that is close to the zone isn't a problem. Right. But them moving out, right. they're they're taking something with them. And it's not people that move to the town after the zone happens and then move out. It's just if you lived there when the zone occurred and then you moved to a different area, you're taking a shit ton of bad luck with you, apparently. And that's kind of what it is, because you don't understand. Like, again, I, I can't stress this enough. Yes, now we have, like, you, you go to high school and they're explaining nuclear energy to you. Right. And what radiation will do to you. It's, like, so common knowledge now. Right. This was magic when it first happened. Like the first, you, you know, Chernobyl, the first time right. you have this nuclear disaster. It's just magic. Right. Evil fucking magic. We can't comprehend. Right. It's like, no, this person it's is... It's like, oh, you touched this metal and suddenly your your hands are falling off and you're getting, like, your skin is sloshing off. And it'll do... What happened? It'll do weird things, too, because you might right. get mild radiation poisoning. Right. And sometimes you'll be close and be exposed to a lot of radiation and right. s- get the mild symptoms. And sometimes, you know, it's it's it depends on how many of the small, invisible, spicy air bullets yeah. hit you. I mean, it's also like uh, there were two cases that I read about with radiation. One where, like, a guy broke into a place and he saw, like, some, gl- like, glowing stuff. So he took it home with him. And, like, his whole family ended up dying because they didn't realize it was radiation. Charlie behavior. <laughs> so, anyway, I saw some spicy and I spaghetti took, and I yeah. took the spicy yeah, spaghetti Yeah, basically. Home. And, like, his daughter rubbed it all over her face because she was seven and she ended up dying. And, like, it took forever for the authorities to figure out what the fuck was going on because none of the townspeople knew that this was radiation related and they had no way of identifying Sure. That. And then there was another case where there was a scientist who was leaning into some kind of collider and, like, it shot radiation in a straight line through his head. Okay. And he ended up surviving, I think. Okay. With, like, no no problems because of just the way it went through his body. That's so, And then the immediate treatment afterwards, too. That's so weird. Yeah, because in one situation, there is knowledge of what it is. And in right. another situation, there is no knowledge. Right. That's, that's fascinating. Well, I mean, it's like when you do watch the HBO Chernobyl series, like, most people don't know what's going on. But then you have that one doctor who's, like, rummaging around for yes. iodine. Yeah, iodine, knowing yeah. what's going on. Yeah. So 
where are we at in this okay. book? So anyway, so uh, I think I just described monkey. Yeah, we got monkey. We got monkey, and we got bu- uh, vulture and or buzzard. So anyway, they uh, they go in together because for some reason I forget why, but vulture steps in hell slime, which causes his look uh, the bones in his legs to just vanish. Okay. Um. So he still has like the skin and the muscles, but like his his bones and his feet and his lower legs are just gone. Okay, in both feet. Yes. In both okay. Feet. So you know, red grabs him and pulls him out, and he's just like, I know you would have left me if I had stepped in that, but I'm not you. Okay. I'm not gonna leave you because I know you have a family. Okay. So he grabs him, he pulls him into the car, um, he sets everything up like they had been fishing and like it had just been an unfortunate accident. He drops him off at a surgeon who cuts who cuts it off so okay. that it doesn't continue spreading up his body. Okay. Um, which manages to save, I believe, his upper leg, his upper legs, rather. But then he, he goes to talk to, like, his family, and his family's fucking mad. They're like, no, you should have left him to die. Okay, because he's a burden now. Yeah, because now he's a burden. And so, like, he kind of feels like trash about that. Red feels like trash for letting him live? No, like, he just feels like trash about the whole situation. Okay. So, the reason they went in is because they had clients that wanted to get a sample of the health slime. Okay. For military research purposes. So Red's just like, oh, we don't have it. We didn't find it. Sorry. Anyway, after that, that's when Red goes to prison. He manages to contact some clients before he goes to let them know where it was, like some different non-military clients. Okay. However, he wants all of the sales not to go to like him getting a lawyer or anything, but just to his wife to support his wife and his ch- child. Okay. And then he uh, gets arrested, and then we have the time skip. Uh, it's a few years, I think, okay. that he's in prison, and he doesn't really have contact with anyone. Anyway, so his old friend, this is part three, uh, Noonan, I think is his friend's name, is revealed to be a operative of a unnamed governmental secret organization working to stop the contraband outflow of artifacts from the zone. He believes he has been successful in stopping this because he's broken up a few of the gangs that have been in control of that. However, his boss is just like, no, you haven't. No, you might have broken them up, but they've like gotten back together in different ways, you dipshit. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing is like, how do you exactly yeah how, stop stop that for sure? It's like trying to have a war on drugs. Like it's not going to work. Wh- which, understandably, trying to prevent people from going into the zone and stealing stuff is a lot more moral than right than uh, trying to stop people from having marijuana. But th- that's something that's just going to be a constant battle. Right. So he's got some, but he's got like, damn it, baby cop, I need you to. <laughs> I need you to think. I need you to stop these people. And it's like, well, I can't. I'm trying. I'm trying, sir. Right. Anyway, so this is where his boss is just like, no, like they they've been doing this, like they've resumed this. However, now it's known as weekend picnics for tourism business. Mm. Yeah. 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 Now we are getting into the picnic element of this. Not quite yet. Well, it's funny because we're using however, pi- we're using picnic in two different ways. I yes. won't I won't spoil because I know what the other you know version of picnic yeah. what, the reason that they call them picnics. We'll get to that. But right now they're go- they're just going on picnics. Right. So then Noonan and a guy meet up and they discuss the the visitation. They discuss the zones and like humanity and politics. And this takes up a lot of pages in the book, actually. Like so, this, so this that's discussion. what the that's what the movie is. Yes. The movie is not politics at all. Right. It is one hundred percent philosophy. Right. It, which is interesting because the games are kind of the reverse. It's mm-hmm. very little philosophy and a lot of politics about like you, you like especially when it's spun off in the metro as well and everything where it's like about Nazis and about communists and about trying to like the the, the idea that even in a post apocalypse you're still going to have these these stupid ideological squabbles. Right. So we're, we're having a big philosophy discussion. Right. And like, I need to find, cause I just, I like screenshotted this part of the book so I could like read part of it to you. All right. So I found my excerpt and that I want to read from the book. Chelsea has an excerpt that she wants to read from the book. <laughs> Elias, make that a sensible thing. <laughs> She's going to read directly from the book now. <laughs> I'm going to attempt it. Okay, so this is from, see here, one character to Noonan. So, no, wait a minute. For some reason, Noonan felt cheated. If you don't know simple things like that, all right, what the hell with reason? Obviously, it's a real quagmire. Okay, but what about the visitation? What do you think about the visitation? My pleasure. Imagine a picnic. Noonan shuddered. What did you say? 
A picnic. Picture a forest. A country road. A meadow. A car drives off into the country road. Into the meadow. A group of young people get out of the car carrying bottles. Baskets of food. All right. Transistor let's, radios. Let's pause for a second. We got our ball. Let's let's have a drink. Let's you know you got your you you have this chai chai me a river craft <laughs> cider. I have my Mad Moon cider. It's black currant. You know, got some. You know, when we're done with this, you know, what we're gonna do. We're gonna take that can and we're gonna take this bottle mm-hmm. and we're gonna go put it in the dumpster. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna do. But so we have these kids doing something similar. They're they're dropping. They're 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 going to have a picnic. Right. And they got some. They got some snackies. They got some snackies. They got a radio. They got cameras. They got cameras, transistor radios, which yes. makes it even funnier because yes. they're they're old timey radios. Right. All right, so let's continue on with this excerpt. They light fires, pitch tents, turn on the music. Mm. In the morning, they leave. The animals, birds, and insects that watched in horror through the long night creep out from their hiding places. And what do they see? Gas and oil spilled on the grass. Old spark plugs and old filters strewn around. Rags, burnt out bulbs, and a monkey wrench left behind. So they're changing the environment from when they before they were there. Right. By just being there. By just existing. By by lighting a fire. There's evidence that they were there. Right. Uh, oil slicks on the pond. And, of course, the usual mess. Apple cores, candy wrappers, charred remains of the campfire, cans, bottles, someone's handkerchief, someone's pin knife, torn newspapers, coins, faded flowers picked in another meadow. I see. A roadside picnic. Precisely. A roadside picnic on some road in the cosmos. And if And you ask if they will come back. Let me have a smoke. God damn this pseudoscience. <laughs> Somehow I imagined it all differently. That's your right. So does that mean they never even noticed us? Why? Well, anyway, didn't pay any attention at all to us? You know, I wouldn't be upset if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> Noonan inhaled, cough, and threw away the cigarette. I don't care, he said stubbornly. It can't be. Damn you, scientists. Where do you get your contempt for man? Why are you always trying to put mankind down? Wait a minute, Valentine said. Listen, you ask me what makes man great, he quoted. Then he recreated nature? That he has harnessed cosmic fornis- for- for- furnaces. forces that in a brief time he conquered the planet and somehow opened a window on the universe? No! That despite all of this, he has survived and intends to survive in the future. There was a silence. Noonan was thinking. Don't get depressed, okay. Valentine okay. said kindly. We, we, we should probably discuss this because okay. like, there's there's a lot to, to really break down there. Right. Like, so are we supposed to know in this metaphor who the kids are in the book yet? I Noonan, no, Valentine goes on to explain, like, the kids are the aliens and we are the ants. So... And then the zones are just the trash that the kids left behind. So... And then he, like this next paragraph that I was going to read. Go go ahead, read it. Okay. The picnic is my own theory. And not even a theory, just a picture. The serious xenologists are working on a much more solid and flattering version for humanity's vanity. For example, that there has been no visitation yet. That that is to come. A highly rational culture through containers with artifacts of its civilization onto Earth. They expect us to study the artifacts, make a giant technological leap, and then send a signal in response that will show that we are ready for contact. How do you like that one? That's interesting. So what we're dealing with here is a conversation between a few people. Yep. And one of them is super red-pilled on what exactly went down. Yes. And then the other one still has some of humanity's vanity left in him, and he's not okay with the idea that we are just little ants. And that we're not the center of the universe. Right. So what is happening is that the aliens come down to Earth, and what I I especially like the bit where they're talking about picking daisies Mm -hmm. from another... So they from another meadow. From another and meadow. Just leaving it in this meadow. So they took stuff from another planet right. or like another dimension even or whatever it is and brought it here. And so like all of their stuff isn't even naturally their stuff. They're just on a picnic. Right. Like the same way that we would go on like a car- cross country tour. Right. We're just one stop. Right. In this. And like something to note is like when this book was written, something typical for picnics was you would take, you know, all of your goodies, you take all your snack all wrapped up and then you would eat and then you would just throw your trash wherever you were. That was very culturally accepted in, like, the 40s and 50s and 60s, even. And now. And now. Well, it... Unfortunately. <laughs> well, we had that mass 
Uh, well, at least in the U.S. I don't know about other places, but... Uh, we, we will at we, least virtue signal about us being... Well, we had those, like, really weird commercials of, like, that Indian crying yeah, about Native trash. American, yeah. Uh, who turns out he was Italian. I don't know if you knew that or not, but the actor <laughs> was actually, like, super I, Italian. <laughs> I did, but at least the gentleman in question was Native American past... You know, they didn't yeah, pick... He, he looked... He did look the part. A little bit like the part. But, like, I, like, I don't know about you, but, like, because of the those ads my mom growing up was very anti-littering so like we would do like whenever we would go on picnics like she would be like okay you have to either take your trash and put it in the picnic basket or you have to put it in your pockets until we find a trash can and if you leave your trash where where we were you're gonna get the shit slapped out of you so yeah and i had a similar mentality but let's just say that America is not a monoculture on that, and plenty no. of people still litter ridiculous things. Oh, yes. But uh, the, the premise at hand, it, it really does... You, you can look at it through so many lenses. You can look at it through the, the literal lens of it being aliens, and then also the fact that we're not okay with it being aliens. And so, like, right. the powers that be, the government, the secret organization, right. is trying to... Find a way to just break the news that right, the and zone they're trying to like break it in a way that doesn't like make people really depressed. Yes, and something I think that is also interesting is just the interview from the beginning with the scientist who's just like, yeah, no, we can pinpoint where where all of the zones were thrown at us in the cosmos, and it, it's far away. So it's like it makes you think like, okay, so if that hit the, the Earth in these six particular places, what about the other planets in our solar system that it hit them in the same way? Was the trash thrown onto them by accident in the same way? Yeah, and the way that the metaphor is set up, it makes you it makes it sound like the aliens came to Earth and they didn't. That's the craziest thing. Right. They're in their car in this metaphor and right. they threw their trash out the window and it hit Earth. Yes, exactly. That gives you such a like disturbing scale right. of the situation of just like radioactive material trash. The, the the same way that we send out trash into the cosmos. Right. When when we're in space. Oh, something broke off. It'll just, there's a lot of space out in space. Who cares? Right. Who cares? Who cares? I mean, it's kind of like how we treat our satellites, actually. It's just, well, it's in space. Who cares? Where? Yeah, we don't yeah. need it. Does it work anymore? No, no, we shut it down. But Okay, well, no, then it's up there and we don't have to worry about it. We don't it. have to worry about it. It's not like air traffic down here where it can, no, it's, it's up. Just who cares? Right. Which, if you like the concept of aliens, like, accidentally fucking with humanity without realizing it, uh, Stephen King wrote Under the Dome, which has an interesting similar premise to it. So, however, it's more focused on the melodrama of humanity's reaction as opposed to, like, an American reaction as opposed yes. to, like, a, a USSR reaction. It is it is a weird thing that they decided to set this in America. I, I do wonder, it could possibly be that when they wrote it, they were worried about the powers that be getting mad about, you know, the conspiratorial right. aspects of it. So if they make it an American drama, you know, there might be, like, there that, that pressure there, even right. though it's a quintessentially... Oh. European story. So what's really funny is there's this one part where one of the characters is like just sitting in a cafe watching a lady eat french fries. However, he's very specific that she's using a fork to eat french fries. And like that that just cracked me up because like Buddy. like no American eats french fries like that. So it just it's like okay, is this really set in like yeah, no, no, no. In, in the Americas, Absolutely not. because like I don't know anybody in the Americas who would use a fork to eat French fries. I don't know anyone <laughs> anywhere eating. And like I think this book was written before McDonald's was. Okay, in. yeah, there is. So that. like you know maybe the writers just didn't have a concept of how people eat French fries. So yeah, that would be my assumption. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because if you know the history of how McDonald's was founded, two brothers founded the. McDonald's, the first McDonald's, mm. and the premise was it's fast food, which was a revolutionary idea, and a guy showed up who ended up being the person who like bought McDonald's from them, right, and franchised it and everything. But the premise was he he was like flipped out the guy who eventually bought it because he saw it and he's like wait whoa whoa wait a second you just hold the burger and you eat the fries and then there's no silverware to clean up you just throw it in the trash. You just throw the wrapper in the trash and you're fine? You're golden? 
and again, it's just the scale of it where it's like, okay, our trash is just paper right. and, and plastic that we're now eating. But like, well, I mean, at the time it wasn't plastic. It was at the just time, paper. it was just paper. It's evolved into plastic, which has evolved into our bloodstream. Into, into <laughs> delicious upscaling the plastics. <laughs> I just want to know why I can't shit out the plastic that I eat right. in in a plastic. You know, maybe one day, one day our colon will will have our plastic colon and our right. other colon. We'll be like wombats. We'll be able to like poop out like little cubes of plastic. Yes. Anyway. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> and so. <laughs> We have the perspective of these being just aliens, but then we also have the perspective of the aliens kind of being a commentary on us and our wasteful nature and how it affects us. So it, it, and it's also a commentary on like the secretive nature of um, governments, of governments, and um, just a group of groups of people in general. Yes, yes. I think because um, like when you have a group of people, they, you, they can get very secretive and like refuse to release details on certain events. Mm. Looking at that one town where that one, one thing, asshole was murdered. One, yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, everybody comes together on a secret, and it's good. Right. Uh, but like the town bully. Like the time that a town just murdered its bully. Okay, that's fine. Who was terrorizing the town, by the way. Well, not so fine is when the government or a big organization that has a lot of power uh, is pulling the strings and everything, and they have secrets that they want to keep. And so... It is kind of this weird thing where on one hand you do have people going into the zone to make money and that is inherently dangerous and everybody understands right. why you would make laws, common sense laws against going into radiation town to grab radiation relics right. because there's a potential profit motive behind that. Then you also have the element of like, all right, but there are all of these benefits that come with this. And you can see that as any sort of invention that we have that is bad for the environment. Right. Where there is that profit motive for right. continuing to do that and the danger involved in it. And right. so it's like playing with this idea. Yeah. You can break this down from so many angles. There, it's so good. There's so many different angles and I love it. All right. So anyway, so he Red gets back from prison and he, he's just like, oh, you know, he gets home and like his daughter is non is essentially nonverbal at this point because she is just fully turning into a human sized monkey. Cool. Yeah, right? Um, and then something previously that this summary didn't mention, and I forgot to bring it up, was um, Red's father was initially in one of the towns that got really sick after the zone hit and turned a bunch of people into what they call zombies. Okay. And um, the government tried to take his father for studying, and Red beat the shit out of the government agents for trying to take his father. That's cool. He beat two of them so badly that the driver, like when he ran outside to beat the shit out of him too, the driver was just gone because he was like, I want no part of this. So so Red isn't this, like, is he supposed to be like a moral or immoral character? Is he just supposed to be like a, I feel a like, person who's caring, who doesn't necessarily always do the right thing? I feel like he's a very moral character. However, he feels like he's not, and that gives him a lot of conflict. Okay. Because I, I feel like he's doing, he's doing his best to do right by everybody around him. Um, however, due to the way society is, what's right isn't always what they want. Okay, so um, he's he's Batman. He's not he's you know the hero that Gotham deserves or whatever. Even if right. it's not the one that they want or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So let's see here, and then so something that Vulture and or Buzzard. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's always going to crack me up, uh, mentioned when his legs were turning to jelly was the Golden Sphere, which in my PDF was just called the Golden Ball. I'm assuming they're the same thing, Buddy. however. <laughs> Buddy translator. <laughs> right? You gotta finesse it a little. You like, gotta thank spend you a for little... throwing it out there for free, but like, I, I mean, he just changed his homework a little bit so that it wouldn't get taken down. Um, so the Golden Sphere and or the Golden Ball is like this mythical thing that nobody has really managed to get to in the zone. But we theorize that it exists? Or... They, they're pretty positive that it exists because I think one person has managed to reach it. And I think that person was actually Vulture, if I remember right. Um, and he wished for his children to be okay. Okay. And All so right. his children came out as humans. Oh. Okay. However, nobody else really believes him. So... They're like, you just got lucky. 
Loki. So without getting into too much detail, this shows up in the Stalker movie and the Stalker video games, and they both call this the Wishmaker. Okay. So in the movie, I believe that they explicitly call it the Wishmaker, Mm -hmm. and in the video games, I know that they do. Mm -hmm. And this is why people want to get in there. And Mm -hmm. in the video game, it's specific, the Stalkers do the same thing. The movie, there's just the Wishmaker. There's not all these anomalous objects. There's just anomalies that are fucking dangerous, and everybody dodges them to get to the Wishmaker. Right. In the video games, you can get a bunch of anomalous objects that you put on you that give you a bunch of different benefits and negatives at the same time. So it's like, hey, I can constantly have my health heal if I have this in my inventory. However, I have jelly licks. However, I like (laughs) get irradiated. Okay. So it's a thing where you can put like a few of those on Mm -hmm. and just keep eating uh, anti-radiation pills and like be able to tank damage. Gotcha. So it's like actively giving yourself a curse for a buff. Right. And they have, they, that's fun that they found a gameplay reason to have stalkers collecting those things. Right. And it's interesting that here you get more, less gamified versions of it where like, hey, you might get uh, this item that makes jewelry that women want or, right. or those kinds of things. Or, then, or you might get this slime that the government really wants, wants for them. weaponizing. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, something I didn't mention previously, but this just reminded me of it is every time Red goes into the zone in the book, he does the nut trick. Okay, explain the nut trick. Okay, so the nut we trick. We love nut tricks. We love nuts, nut, nuts, nut, nuts, 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 nuts. <laughs> so in the movie and in Roadside Picnic. And in the games. And in the games is stalkers will take um, like nuts from nuts and bolts and put like a little bit of fabric in it and like, like throw it. So it's a little streamer. Yeah, so it's like a little party streamer. And they'll throw it, figure out where anomalous activity is happening so they can avoid that section. And in the book, something that happens the first time we we are with them when they go into the zone is Red is throwing these nuts. And then there's this one part where he just stops and he's, he's like, okay, my brain is melting. I can't think. I can't throw anything in this direction. Oh, fuck. There's an anom- 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 anomaly. anomaly there. I have to turn and throw the nut in the other direction. I have to force myself to turn and throw the nut in the other direction. Okay, so the anomaly... And then, like, his friend who's with him is just like, hey, you okay there, bud? So the anomaly is, get- is like... It's like causing his brain to melt. So that's what the anomaly is, to be clear, is that it is causing a panic attack in his brain. Right. And making him catatonic, like he can't move. Right. And he's like trying to get back control over his body. Right. Horrific. Which he manages to do, and they manage to go around it. However, his friend hadn't been hit by that yet, so his friend's just like, what is happening It's here? almost like this is a perfect thing to do if you don't have a lot of money and want to make a movie. It's like, this is the perfect thing to make a script out of it. Right. <laughs> and the, the stalker movie right. does a lot with... Very little. Like, if you like your early Marble Hornets and your early Everyman hybrids and want to see that, but with better cinematography, that's what the movie is. Right. It's There's not a lot of action. There's not a lot going on. And they right. do a lot with just having a bunch of Russian fields and three dudes just, have it, just throwing nuts at each other. <laughs> Another thing that happens in a roadside picnic, and I think you don't actually see this happening, or you might see this happening at some point, actually, I think, in, in this excursion where he goes in with um, Buzzard's son, uh, or Vulture's son, um, but something he talks about, and something that is a topic of conversation during the long bit, long section in the book where they are just talking about the zone, is um, there are sections of the zone where gravity just increases by a hundred, and okay. it's random, and this is an anomaly that they can avoid using nuts. Um, so, however, so to be clear, what they're doing is they got the nuts. Right. And in the video game, what will happen is there will be, you know how like in real life, you'll get little dirt devils, like little mm-hmm. tornadoes that are just tiny. It's like those, but they'll fucking rip you to shreds. Right. Just instantly, just like, boom, like you're, you're, you've been sent into a blender. Right. So you throw the nut ahead and it will clear up, like you'll see the path. And if the nut just lands, then you are free to walk to the nut pick up the nut, and then throw it again, because if the tornado is there, it'll send the nut just flying off, and you'll know, okay, I can't go there. I can't, yeah. And then the same thing will happen here, where it's like you throw the nut, and if the nut has a weird effect, 
Right. You know. You know not to go that way. Something interesting about the conversation where he's talking about, like, the way gravity will occasionally just rupture and go a hundredfold, and, like, anybody standing in that will just go splat immediately, is he's trying to explain this phenomenon to, like, a scientist. And the scientist is like, I don't understand. I don't understand. This can't be right. I don't understand. Until eventually the scientist is like, oh, I'm going to call that, like, a weird sciencey name. And then suddenly he can understand it. And then, like, there's a conversation about how, oh, so you can't understand it until you put it into scientific terms. However, it's an, it's a thing that is happening to people. That is super interesting because they there, there is that element of just denial. And right. again, that goes back to things that happened in Chernobyl where they're like, no, we follow the plan and the, 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 the this is like the, the system. This is the system that the government laid out for us. So anything that's unaccounted for is bullshit. It's not right. real. So it's, it, it is just that schema. And then once they can put it into their mind scheme of like, this is how this works. It's like, oh, okay, then it is real. And it's like, oh my god. Oh, right. Stop. Like, how could you not understand this was real before, before this? And so you're, you're talking to, to somebody who is like read for all intents and purposes here is an authority. Right. On this. Because he is a well seasoned stalker. Right. He would know better than the scientist who is studying the stuff in the lab. Right. And he says it and the scientist just doesn't believe it. Right. Even though the zones are a manifestation of a bunch of random shit. Of random shit. The the person just still won't buy it. Right. That is perfect. I thought it was like a really interesting that's, that's, touch on like... That's where it's getting super political of yeah. like, yeah. But yeah, and then like another thing they mention is just like how some areas just turn into ruins and then others are just pristine. Even though nobody's keeping maintenance on those buildings, they are just, they look exactly the same way and there's no dust in some of them. However, others are just absolute ruins. Also funny, because um, we're, we're talking about the Stalker movie. Mm-hmm. We're also talking about a Annihilation here, mm-hmm. where both are. I, I, I don't like to go up film directors' asses and say, like, "Oh my god, it's so sim-. those are such cinematic movies, both of them." You're right. And so they're both so well done. Annihilation, the the movie that you're a fan of, I'm a fan of, and Abysme Scream Bear Waifu. He loves his Annihilation movie. Did he buy the Bear Waifu? Because you know it was up it was up for auction. Like I know a couple it, months ago. I think we or he, like was it a year ago? Time is irrelevant. Oh shit, we never turned that into a bit. But no, I don't think he bought it. <laughs> That's unfortunate. We, I forgot we were. I was supposed to write that down. It must have slipped through my notes. I was going to make that a bit. But it, so we we do get. Yeah. So like there. I, I don't know if Jeff Vandermeer who wrote the wrote the Annihilation Reach, movie. Yeah. He, he wrote the book. He wrote the book. <laughs> he wrote the book. He wrote the Southern Reach trilogy, which is what the novels are referred to. But Annihilation has like a lot. So it, it feels a lot like Roadside Picnic. Like there are with lesbians. With, it is just lesbian. So that's the funny thing is Roadside Picnic and the Stalker movie. Old dudes. You right. like old dudes. Enjoy like, these old dudes. You like old dudes talking about philosophy and like how bad society is. Stalker is for you. And then Annihilation is that, but with hot chicks. And something like Jeff Vandermeer is very concerned about is like the environment. And like that really shows in everything he writes. And like, I feel like if you took Roadside Picnic and like wrote it through like the lens of an environmentalist, that's what you, that's how you get Jeff Vandermeer. And I love it. Like, it's I, fantastic. I think that you do... But also, he, he a lot of his stuff is very Cronenberg-y. So, sure. you know, there is also that. The, there is the... It, it is, you know, you got that that right. pepper kick of Cronenberg in there, too, which right. is nice. In, in the movie, it, at least. I can't read. Everybody's intimately aware with that. What I love about the Annihilation movie is the director read Annihilation once, and then he was like, okay, I'm going to treat this movie like I would a fever dream. <laughs> <laughs> There, there is uh, some elements in there of having a bit of a fever dream out in the wild. It is fun. It's it kind of midsummery in some ways. Right. But what I would say is a lot of the times when you hear people whinge on and on about the environment and how we're destroying the environment and everything, I think people get very 
jaded to that. And I think that part of that is we have so much, and I'll, I'll use that term again, like virtue signaling about doing something for the environment. We, we don't think a lot about our place in the environment and how it's like directly affecting us for just like a selfish reason right. about like, we have to take care of the environment selfishly. I mean, it's like that part in like Guardians of the Galaxy of just like when Rocket the Raccoon is just like, well, what do you care about the, the universe? What do you care about this galaxy? And what's his face is just like, I live in it, dipshit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, that's why you should care. We live in it. We're making it hostile for us. And it's just a, a, a matter of practical, like practical application of it. And again, framing it through that like alien lens of like humans almost being aliens in their own habitat with how different we live now. Right. So you could also interpret it as like, we are the aliens ruining our own right. situation. Or, or rather companies and like large corporations. A, a modern which, life. I think a good way to say yes, that, that life. might not offend anybody is it's modern humans are living a very different life that's modified right. by how, you know, traditionally we were hunter gatherers and now like through, through a long march of history, we have gotten super specific with our job descriptions. Right. We, we now don't divide things by women stay at the camp and men go out and hunt. Now labor is like, okay, you give your kids to the state and they parent your kids while you go off and make bottle cap tops out of plastic. Right. And you barely make enough to hit your rents and pay for food for your children. And in this alienating life, you might turn to something that might hurt the environment, like going into the zone and grabbing something that might or might not right. belong in the zone and it needs to stay there. Or it might be, you know, something that'll make you a little bit of cash when you come out of the zone. Right. You kind of don't care. Right. Because you no longer have the capability to care. You, you don't care about the world. You care about like your immediate right. situation. This is what's so awesome about Roadside picnic. Roadside picnic is like the, the different ways you can break down the philosophy of it. Right. And Annihilation is a very different story. I'm just saying you can feel echoes of Roadside yes. Picnic in it. That's all I want to say. So does it kind of end with our discussion okay. about what a roadside picnic is? and, and... No, there's a lot more book to that. Okay. Let's... <laughs> you know, for being only like 126 pages, this is a very dense, dense book. Hmm. Anyway, so the Golden Sphere is what Red wants to reach when he goes into the zone for the last time. He's like, this is my last trip. This is <laughs> one last job. Yeah, basically. <laughs> It's a trope um, for a reason. Right. So he has a map which was given to him by Vulture. And Vulture's son, whose name is Arthur, joins him on the expedition. Red um, decides to do the one thing he feels is very immoral. However, he feels like he has to do this. And that is bringing Buzzard's Vulture's son into the expedition in order to basically kill him. In order to reach the Golden Sphere. So he is planning on betraying him the entire time. Yes. Oh, and I feel okay. like this is the one immoral thing he really does in the book, which is very fascinating because he chooses to do it because he wants to keep his daughter from essentially morphing into a, like further morphing into a monkey. So he, you know, we haven't gone to it yet, but there is something where he needs, he, there's some potential danger and he's going to throw Vulture's son into the way of danger to get to the golden sphere. Right. The, the golden circle boy. Right. To make a wish that his daughter not be anomalous. Right. Exactly. And like, you know, he, he's like, you know, this clearly worked for Vulture and his children. So maybe this will work for my child because Arthur is 100% human and fine. Okay. Arthur being the kid. Arthur being one of Vulture's children. He has multiple children. So, and all of them are just human and like have no effects from him going into the zone, which I think is a really interesting thing. Because again, we're, t we're talking like, again, now we have such a concrete, li like even if you aren't a nuclear physicist as you're, you know, if you're a nuclear physicist out there in the audience, even if you don't know the, the specifics of nuclear energy, you have a concrete idea of how it functions. They super didn't. So right. even like a wish-making orb really isn't out of the realm of possibility. You right. know what I mean? Like, it sounds super supernatural and like ridiculous, but again, 
the idea that like air could hit you right and you fucking rupture and, with blood it right. just doesn't make any sense anyway so they they have to go through a bunch of different issues like they have to go through like a bunch of different events in uh, order to get the pit and the pendulum yeah in order to get through to the the sphere however before they can get to the sphere the sphere is surrounded by this phenomenon that they call the meat grinder and that's why he wanted arthur to come with them because he's just going to throw arthur into the meat grinder Okay. So that he can, like, essentially, like, because the meat grinder, I guess, will die down with somebody's death, and then he's planning to rush right past and reach the, the sphere. Do we know what Vulture did to get to the... Oh, Vulture killed, like, a bunch of people. Okay. Vulture, like, led a New. bunch of people. Okay. Yeah, oh, no. Okay. Like, that's part of the reason why he's called Vulture in the book, or Buzzard, oh, so <laughs> depending they, on your translation. They, they... And, like, everybody knew he would just leave people to die. So this whole time... Red and Vulture have been friends or acquaintances. They've been like co-workers. They've been like co-workers, yeah. but I'm guessing that Red being Mr. Main Character probably didn't care for Vulture and just kind of like had this this relationship with him. Right. But it's fucked up because he can't throw Vulture into the main grinder. Right, because Vulture no longer has legs. Vulture can't get there. Right. And so... That's what makes it super morally dubious that he's just using the sun instead. Right. Um, but I think it was when he saved Vulture is when Vulture told him, like, hey, if you want to get to the sphere, you need to kill someone. Okay. So, Ooh, was Vulture planning on... I don't know if Vulture was planning on doing that because Vulture's kids were fine at that point. However, because okay. Red saved him, Vulture was like, hey, okay. I, I owe you one. You did me a solid. Okay. So anyway, so they managed to make it to the meat grinder section. And so Arthur rushes towards the sphere and Red doesn't stop him because Red's like, he's going to die. It's He's going to die and then I can get to the sphere after he's dead. However, Arthur gets cut up. He gets cut up to hell, but he manages to reach the sphere through the meat grinder, which no, like Red was not anticipating him to be able to do that. So Arthur manages to get to it, and his he, he wishes for everybody to be happy and free and nobody left behind, and then he dies from his injuries. Okay. And then Red, like, just sits there, and it's just like, what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> no, I wanted I wanted to wish for my daughter to be okay, and, like, somehow this nincompoop managed to reach the sphere and wish for everybody to be happy. And then after after thinking about it, after looking on in confusion and bitterness, he finds he cannot articulate what he really actually wants from the sphere. Like, yeah, he wants his daughter to be human. But okay, like, so now he's in soliloquy mode. Oh, yeah. And he's, he's trying. He's, <laughs> he's like, trying to figure out, like, what to do. He turned into a Shakespeare character yeah. and he's like talking to himself and he's like, what did I really want out of all of this? Basically. <laughs> And then, so then, after thinking about it a lot, Red's just like, okay, I'm just going to touch it, and then, like, whatever the sphere does, that's what I'm going to wish for. Okay. Essentially, like, like it's very reminiscent of... So, so he gets through the meat grinder, too. He, well, the meat grinder calms down because Arthur oh, died. Oh, okay, so, okay, so... It's just Arthur managed to touch the sphere and make a wish before dying. So he, so I'm guessing he gets through and he's cut up to shit, but it, he seems like he's completely fine, and then very unexpectedly... Oh, no, he was very much dying. Oh, he was it, what was unexpected was him getting back up and grabbing it. Okay. Like, Red was like, okay, the kid's dead. Oh, shit, the kid's not dead. Okay. <laughs> so, Red leaves it to the sphere to look into his soul to figure out what his wish was. And then, in an irony, he winds up obsessing in the same way that Arthur had, had said the phrase. And so he just says, happiness for everyone, freedom, and may nobody be left behind. And then the book just ends. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. That's very... That's a, that's a good place to cut it. Something interesting, though, is things... Something I've seen mentioned over and over again in an, uh, analysis is, analysis of this is um, happiness cannot exist while the zones exist. Okay. Like, so, a lot of people keep bringing up, like, it doesn't seem like people can be happy as long as these zones exist. So that wish probably causes the zones to stop existing. However, nobody can actually ask, ask the authors if that's what ends up happening. That's that's true. I guess you could also... Th that could take you a lot of places, and that mm -hmm. is a good cliffhanger to end on, is mm -hmm. just him repeating what is said. Right. There is a, a big question about what happiness could be. I guess that it would... You know, that's the starting place, is getting rid of the zones. That's still not going to make everybody happy. 
Right. But that's like the first step. That's the first step. Yeah. Wow. What a what an excellent story. Yeah. It's fantastic. I think there might be an audiobook version of it somewhere. You you also it, it's interesting. So like we don't get uh, in the story, we don't get any interactions with the aliens again. They're yeah, they they're don't. driving by throwing trash out the window mm-hmm. of their, you know, Ford hatchback right. of a spaceship and it hits Earth and it causes the zones and we get no glimpse into all the we, we just see the carnage that they cause. Right. So what do do we get any further explanation or do they really just leave it at that's the picnic and we get it from the new noon what's the name of the character? Noonan. Noonan. Okay. So Noonan explains this and that's the only glimpse we get into that element. I think Valentine was the one explaining that and Noonan was the one that was having a bad reaction okay. to it. But I think something Valentine brought up was um, the fact that um, if it eat, or maybe it was Noonan that brought this up, but uh, one of them brings up the fact that you know all these objects that we found how do these relate to a picnic because that doesn't make sense to me okay. how, how does something that can melt through any material we know of constitute a picnic like so like in a literal sense he doesn't understand it no like he manages to make it into the metaphor but he's like you know like why would you bring like things that we can turn into pretty jewelry and something that can melt through concrete and then something else that can just rip bones out of people's bodies like how not, not rip Delete. Delete, yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> that's the alarming the part. <laughs> delete. And he's like, why? Rip, rip we could almost understand. Right, but delete, just delete. Is, is just no. That doesn't And make... then, like, slowly continue deleting. Yeah. Um, and, he, you know, like, his question is just like, how would this, why would all of this stuff, how does any of this relate to each other in any sense? Like if there's and that's bias. that's how alien it is, and right. he just can't wrap his head around. Right. That's that is how alien it is. That's right. what the word alien means. Is just like we can't comprehend. We this. can't comprehend it. It's foreign. It's beyond our. It's beyond our, our scope of understanding. And it's funny because like a lot of times in science fiction, you almost have trouble expo- like you you have trouble getting it rid of your human mindset right to explore like no it gets way weirder than we could possibly imagine right and I, you you get the lovecraft like it's beyond comprehension right what's crazy is that they're the effects a lot of the time that aren't beyond comprehension right. they're just beyond explanation right we can comprehend the idea of the bones and the leg getting deleted. We can't comprehend why. We can't comprehend how that would be applicable in in relative sense to everything else that, that has been left behind that's causing all of these. Like, how does a golden sphere that grants wishes relate to a goo that deletes bones? You know, and it's interesting, too, is the golden sphere isn't actually used in the books or the games, and both of them don't really give you... Th- they don't show you a picture. And it's not like, used in the movie? It's not used in the movie. because okay, he just used it in the book. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's the point. Is like, there, there is a wishmaker there. Right. But, like, they don't show you the mm-hmm. thing. It's just, you go into that room, mm-hmm. and the wishmaker thing is there. Right. And in the, well, I'm not going to give too much away about the movie, but it's just like, the, hey, right around that corner is the wish. There's a long scene where it's just like, the wishmaker thing is in there. Right. All right, I guess it's time go to go in make there. Wish. Make right. a wish. <laughs> go to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. <laughs> it's time to go make a wish. Oh, man, I wish for John Cena to come visit me. But yeah, no, that's it is very interesting. And like it's very specific that it is a golden sphere. That's weird. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Is the golden sphere money? Tis it's capitalism. <laughs> it just cuts off. Nobody No, knows. nobody, yeah, yeah, no. yeah. This has been a special episode of the Fear Fiction Podcast. Your hosts were Speed Reader Chelsea and Backwards Reader Dead Palette. Music by Abysme. Art by C.F. Comer. Let us know if you enjoy these weird departure episodes in the comments below. And be sure to like and subscribe. Now, get out of here, stalker! Cumian, I have something to tell you. Something to show you. 
like capitalist American school material time, how you say tell show. But object also important. Story first. In old country, there is place called the zone. The zone is like American zone. Auto zone. Has valuable parts. Parts that are hard to understand. Functions hidden. Require tests for knowledge. Auto zone is mm, glow. Like roof lights at auto zone. Auto dangerous. No comrade wants to enter zone like American auto zone. But inside zone, there are treasures. See, there is boy. Boy who like me. But me? Ill. Can't walk. Can't build collage. Can't tell rumor from truth. So boy sneaks into zone to get gamer da vincica pisiat. No English word. Gold liquid heals the sick. But also causes, eh... You know, head soup. Brain girl? You know, no, no think good. Anyway, boy goes into zone with comrades. One comrade steps in hand soap. Starts growing hands on mm, 95% of his body. Comrades mercy kill with Makarov. Another hops on crazy train. Begins spewing capitalist lies about free healthcare. Nonsense. No such thing anywhere. Old country provides citizens. Citizens tell each other to push on, toughen up. Plenty good. He never get off crazy train. Less comrade a boy pulls fire alarm. Catches on fire, that's alarming boy. Finally, boy finds ghost factory. Home of gold liquid that heals sickness. He comes out with liquid and deep scars all over mind and body. Boy comes home, kisses liquid into my mouth while I sleep. I'm healed, no longer on deathbed. Happy to build kolosh again, eat cabbage pierogies without spew on floor. So, report Scar Boy for entering the zone. KGB make boy vanish, no true comrade would enter forbidden zone. But yeah, um, if you enjoy Roadside Picnic, Southern Reach Trilogy is also fantastic, which is Annihilation is the first book, uh, Authority, and then there's another one I forget the name of. And the, the interesting I thing about that the book and find out the is uh, all the books are kind of written from different perspectives. Some of them are more... Acceptance, that's the last one. Yeah, no, they're all written from different perspectives and different reactions. So you get... It, it is a write you what you know kind of thing where I always write characters that I can voice because that's mm-hmm. who I am. But like these, you get a scientist character, you get a, a diary kind of thing. And then there is one, isn't there one that's like a third person, like just explaining facts? Right. So, yeah, no, I think that was the fourth one, actually, that nobody expected. <laughs> that Jeff was just like, here's one that's just facts. <laughs> And so um, it is interesting to just see how this this relatively unknown book spawned all of this different thing that just really hit the zeitgeist as of recent. And uh, these stalker games have been very fun. And, you know, with global tensions escalating and uh, Russia and Ukraine being at war, it's it's interesting to see a, a, a peer into that part of the world and their perspective on uh, philosophy and politics. Right. And horror. Yes. Especially. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this experimental episode. Uh, yeah, talk, talk about it in this area. Um, okay, so recommended Southern Reach. Uh, I know I mentioned earlier Under the Dome by Stephen King. And then there's a one last book that I've read in this kind of genre that I'd recommend called The Emissary. And Did you even expect it to be that kind of book when you no. started reading it? So this is a translation of a Japanese novel. So it's like same similar premise, but from a Japanese cultural perspective, which I find it incredibly fascinating. And I ain't gonna say anything else about it past that. <laughs> the Emissary by Yoko... Uh, Tawanda. Tawanda. And, you know, that's that's that. You can also check out that. Yep, it's a very strange... Like, I know Roadside Picnic is strange in its own way. Um, Annihilation is definitely strange in its own way. The Emissary is, like, crank that up by a hundred. Like, this gets into some really 
weird scenarios really fast. And you have to be like willing to adapt to those strange scenarios as you're reading it. And it's only 138 pages long. I'm guessing it, that it's written in a way that's actually kind of digestible. Or is it difficult? Um, I found it very digestible. I also found it very... I mean, I feel like you do need to have like a bit of an understanding of certain Japanese words or a willingness to stop reading and search for some Japanese words because there are some things that just didn't translate. So they didn't give you <laughs> the, the, the Viz Media or Tokyo pop translation notes. No, and th they also didn't do, like, that keikaku means plan thing. Ke keikaku they means plan. They just, like, throw certain words in here and, like, expect katana. you to do your own research on them. Katana means Japanese katana. Yeah. But what's interesting, though, and the reason that I bring up how readable it is, is that these stories, again, talking about anomalous objects, a big critique that a lot of people have in the RPC community, um, not all of them, but some of them, is that RPC and SCP, and they, they have this critique of all of them, is that the anomalous objects and the way that they're set up, it, their dryness is both a benefit mm. and a curse. Right. But they're kind of like stuck in this rigid writing style. Mm. And these all kind of like have the same thing, but they're taking on so much more personality. Oh, yeah. They're, they're all so very different. Like, even like with Annihilation and Authority, both like Jeff Vandermeer wrote them in completely different styles from completely different perspectives. And he did a wonderful job of that. Like, fantastic writing. A good way to put it and is then, is the difference between Abandoned by Disney and uh, A Few Suggestions and Corruptus. All of these stories and, and uh, Room Zero. Right. All of these are stories about, um, you know, this anomalous Disneyland area. Right. But it's explaining them from wildly different perspectives. Right. And then, like, the emissary is just, like, from the perspective of this grandfather who's trying to take care of his child who's turning into an anonymous anomalous Anon being Anon he's turning into anonymous <laughs> the poor <laughs> check the poor <laughs> yeah no he's turning into like this strange bird thing and like his grandfather is like i how do i take care of you through this and you know what has been crazy about all of this is throughout this entire thing Brandon has restrained bringing up Boogie Pop Phantom. Oh, yeah, that's see, that's another good one. It's like Boogie Pop kind of it does touch on it, the same thing. It's, uh, it? it's exactly the same thing, but it is much more of a how would you put that? A, a children's angsty. I'd say it's more like teenage angst teenage, reaction she, yes. to this kind of kind well, of material. Well, also children, because a lot of the, the traumas that made the, the villains of Boogie Pop what they are kind of happened at an earlier age. Mm. Like, hey, I hate useless things that don't become anything, and a person just becomes a pure, weird utilitarian, and they're just like, people that don't serve a purpose mm. can get exploded. So I guess if you're looking for like different age perspectives, like all like all these different books hit different age groups. Like Boogie Pop for the younger for crowd. For the younger crowd. Um I'd say Annihilation is is your political awakening to like your your yeah. environmentalism, your twenties of like Right. <laughs> Under the dome would probably be like thirties or forties being like done with life. Yes. And then like the emissary is like you are a grandfather trying to figure out how to take care of your child. <laughs> In a world where all of this shit is happening. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of where we're all at, is, <laughs> is living in a world where a lot of shit is happening. And we just have to roll with the punches. We just have to roll with it and uh, not be depressed about it. That's yeah. pretty much our only goal out of all this. Yeah, and, you know, I feel like Emissary covers that pretty well. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely recommend that. Anyway. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, excursion into the zone. I hope you did, too.